good day, everyone from Washington, D.C., and it's so nice to see all these wonderful greetings in our chat this morning. Hope we keep it up throughout the program. In any case, a very warm welcome from the Africa Center to all our alumni, colleagues, and partners from over 50 countries across Africa and beyond who have registered for today's webinar, State Responses to the Use of Information Technology by Africa's Violent Extremist Groups. My name is Nate Allen, and I am Assistant Professor of Security Studies here at the Africa Center, as well as the Africa Center's faculty lead on cyber issues. Before we continue with today's program and get to our content, it's my pleasure to introduce the Africa Center Director, Kate Omquist Knopf, to say a few words. Kate, over to you. Uh, well, thank you, Nate, and good day uh, to all of our uh, colleagues, uh, alumni, and uh, uh, friends who have joined us for this program today. We're really delighted, as Nate said, uh, to have you with us and looking forward to, to our discussion. Just a brief word, uh, a background about the Africa Center for those of you who may not know us. Uh, we serve as a forum for research, for academic programs, and for the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a Department of Defense Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. And we carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. And recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities such as we have today for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. And by engaging together military and civilian, governmental and civil society, as well as national, regional and international, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. This kind of knowledge, uh, we hope, infused with real world experiences and fresh analysis, uh, provides an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. So thank you uh, for joining us for this discussion today uh, on cybersecurity. Thank you in advance uh, to our panelists uh, for bringing us their expertise and their insights. Uh, and uh, thanks to Nate for moderating this conversation. Back to you, looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, so now to introduce today's webinar and our panelists. The topic of today's webinar is the state response to the use of information technology by Africa's violent extremist groups. Uh, this is a deliberately chosen topic and one of clear and compelling importance to Africa's national security community. Um, we're using today to build on a previous webinar we had about six months ago in May, and I'd like to lay out a few key points that emerged from that webinar before we continue. So first, I'd say there's a limited understanding of the scope and the scale of the cyber-related threat from Africa's violent extremists. And this is because discussions of the nature of this threat tend to focus either on how to prevent the possibility of a cyber attack by a terrorist group or how to respond to violent extremist propaganda. Um, however, the threat from the former remains more theoretical than actual, in, in my opinion. I'm aware that no, no cyber attack by a terrorist group where they have occurred has resulted in any kind of extensive physical damage or, or, or casualties. It's not yet like a primary modus operandi for Africa's violent extremists. And certainly while the threat from violent extremist propaganda remains concerning, um, it's only one of the ways in which information technology we're gonna discuss today is influencing the broader scope and scale of the threat. So a key reason for this limited understanding, and then secondly, is that modern information and communications technology is broader than what goes on via the internet. It can be thought of as what's called an enabling technology, like electricity, that is causing broad technological innovation in everything from intelligence collection techniques to weapons platforms. And states and security sector actors in Africa need not only concern themselves in responding to violent extremist propaganda, but also in considering how these advances in information technology are influencing how violent extremists organize and learn, um, the means through which they gather intelligence and acquire resources, 
and the tools and tactics, such as Infobytes explosive devices or remote assassination techniques, they may use to commit violence. Um, so it's vital that we better understand this threat in order to get a sense of what the nature of response has been and, and ought to be. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And I, I don't think, I think we have two excellent panelists that could not be better equipped to help us explore this issue in, in some detail. So you should have access to their biographies via the website. Um, if it hasn't been linked already, I, I encourage it to, to be linked. Um, but I, I it, uh, but uh, so I'm going to keep my introduction relatively brief. Um, and I invite our panelists to turn on their, their cameras and, and, and videos if they have not already. So uh, Ms. Karen Allen is a senior consultant for the Institute for International Security Studies and a visiting fellow in the Department of War Studies at King's College London. A former BBC foreign correspondent, she is one of the leading experts on the threats, challenges, and strategic implications posed by the spread of emerging technology in Africa. Her work at ISS, so which I hope many of you are familiar with, has explored how social media, surveillance, artificial intelligence, and unmanned aerial vehicles are impacting security challenges all across the continent. Next, we have with us uh, Mr. Murtala Abdullahi. He is a climate and security reporter with Humangle, where he writes about Nigeria's military, local conflict, and climate security in the Lake Chad region and the Sahel. He is also the founder of the Goro Initiative and a global shaper with the Abuja Hub, where he writes and conducts dialogues on national and regional security trends. He's a keen observer of how both states and non-state actors, violent extremist actors in Nigeria, have leveraged emerging technology and information technology in pursuit of their goals. So we're absolutely delighted to have both of you with us today. Um, we're gonna start with you, Karen, to discuss some of the broader ways in which states in Africa are responding to the use of ICT by violent extremists, and then go to you, Murtala, to talk a little bit more about how these challenges are playing out in Nigeria and draw out some of the, the, the lessons learned. So, uh, Karen, um, I'd like you to, to just briefly, uh, building on what I, what I mentioned earlier, discuss the main ways in which you see violent extremist organizations across Africa leveraging information technology. In your view, how, how much broader is the threat than just social media? Yeah, good point. Thanks, Nate. Uh, thanks, Kate, as well for the introduction and greetings to my colleague, uh, Matala, and everyone else joining this. You've really hit the nail on the head when you remind us that ICT is an enabling technology. It's foundational. Um, and in many ways, in many parts of Africa, being less cyber mature, where internet penetration is still relatively low, some of the potential threats are not immediately clear and the unintended consequences of not perhaps as obvious as they may be in other settings. Your questions about sort of combat operations, extremist groups, and how um, the different types of technology is, is used. Quick note, uh, first of all, the notion of this battle space, or indeed the notion of combat, i.e. who's a combatant, who's not, set out in the laws of our conflict, uh, conflict. It, it's a fascinating question, isn't it? It's one we don't have time for today. But ICT and who deploys it has completely changed who a combatant actually is uh, and where the responsibility in terms of the legal responsibility lies. Also, another note to self, when we think about combat theatre and theatre of operations, you know, violent extremist groups are not just operating in the battle spaces, in traditional battle spaces. Uh, we are seeing them, of course, in places like the Sahel, in the Horn of Africa, and now in northern Mozambique. But we also need to understand that the battle space, to use the terminology of the past, may also be in our homes, on the streets, in our living rooms, in our workspaces. I think it's important to bear that in mind, because as you say, it allows us to look at ICT as an ecosystem, as an environment where lots of different things are going on. So how extremist groups leveraging tech for, for combat operations? Well, let's start first of all with drone technology, uh, UAS, unmanned aerial systems. Uh, they're linked by mobile devices and their proliferation has been very dramatic across Africa. I've had debates with people a couple of years ago as to whether or not we should talk about drones within the context of ICT. My feeling is we absolutely must. They're connected by uh, their network, they're connected by technology, and increasingly we talk about drone swarms as a potential future threat. Uh, I think they fit very clearly into this category. So we have seen the expansion of drone technology. It's affordable technology. It's pretty easy to acquire. And we've seen rapid diffusion of uh, UAS systems. 
We've seen drones used for ISR, for intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance purposes. And there is a possibility of seeing drones being used as weapons delivery systems, similar to what we've seen in Iraq and Syria. But to date, within an African setting, uh, generally speaking, we have seen them mainly for uh, ISR purposes. They also have a very potent psychological component, enabling threat actors to command more physical territory, as well as, as controlling the narrative of conflict. We're seeing Al-Shabaab in Somalia, but also on the border with Kenya doing this. Uh, they're using um, drones for uh, both uh, surveillance and reconnaissance purposes. We're also seeing them used in both maritime and land-based operations. Uh, we're seeing drones for purpose, for propaganda purposes, You'll remember that a drone was used to film an attack on the Manda Bay base in Kenya, attack that happened in January 2020. In future, that collection of material could be used for propaganda purposes, for recruitment purposes. It's giving access in a way we haven't seen before. We've seen the use of drones in Mozambique. We've had reports from the Mozambican military of UAS systems being deployed by insurgents groups uh, in the northern region of Cabo Delgado province. Anusana Wajama or Ansar Suna in Cabo Delgado have been uh, using these very simplified types of drones. We've also seen the growth of hobbyist drones uh, and drone enhancements. These are the kinds of drones that you might buy your kid for Christmas. Um, they are very easy to acquire, they're simple to deploy, and they're often hard to detect and even harder to shoot down. We've seen hobbyist drones being deployed as weapons in theatres such as Iraq uh, and the Battle of Mosul in 2016. And this is where my particular interest in this came, having seen this firsthand. Have we seen the weaponization of drones in this same way as a delivery system in Africa? Not yet, but we have seen the potential for enhancements to be added onto, the, onto these. We've even seen the assassination attempt against the Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa Kadimi. A small quadricopter drone was used in the attack, according to Iraqi, Iraqi military. These types of drones are finding themselves into the hands of extremist groups here. There's been much written about uh, the use of, of UAS systems for strategic balancing, particularly in Libya, with proxy forces uh, receiving drone equipment from allies. My colleague Matt Herbert from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime has written extensively on this. And if anyone's interested, I would really, really encourage them to read his work. We're also seeing them in Yemen. Why are we seeing this kind of drone technology adopted briefly? Well, as I say, the advantages of UAS systems, they're quickly bought. They can be brought up to scale very, very easily. Um, in, um, in, in Iraq and Syria, we saw drone factories uh, being used where between 60 and 100 aerial IS, ISIS drones uh, that had been involved in strike missions were, were detected. Uh, these were brought in across the border, bought in bulk, uh, and literally driven across the border and positioned in sites. We're also seeing ev evidence of indigenous innovation of um, drones of these types of technologies rather than technology transfer. So let me park that just for a moment as one way ICT is being deployed. We've seen extremist groups in Africa use uh, ICT for influence, influence on social media platforms to radicalize, to recruit, to exhibit uh, acts of terror, to also um, exhibit propaganda. I've mentioned we've seen Al-Shabaab do this for the use of chat rooms and dark web platforms. Remember the Westgate attack in 2013 that was live blogged by Al-Shabaab. Um, we've also seen um, the use of open source data sources being an important tool for, um, for, for threat groups to be able to uh, identify potential targets, but also to build their intelligence capabilities. We've used, seen the use of ICT technologies by groups such as Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, by mobile phones, CCTV technologies, biometric systems, satellite imagery, data mining and the like. We've seen the limited use of cyber attacks for the purposes of coercion. Uh, Boko Haram uh, were behind a major um, information leak, an intel leak, um, that was uh, reported after they hacked into the database of Nigeria's intelligence services and leaked information there. This has been a fairly limited tactic that's been used, but nevertheless, it has been adopted. And something I do want to really highlight, Given the nexus between violent non-state actors, extremist groups, 
with organized crime. We've seen a massive expansion across Africa in cyber enabled crime. And in many ways, this is possibly the, the biggest threat. What I mean by cyber enabled crime is crimes which might be traditional crimes, such as fraud, such as counterfeits, such as human trafficking, which are perpetrated through the use of the internet. So we've seen the selling of rubies, the selling of ivories and other wildlife products and other contraband, which assist in financing terror operations. The internet has become a marketplace for transnational organized crime groups, and many of them have got very close links uh, with extremist groups. Nearly at the end, in fragile settings, not necessarily the traditional bat battle round, we're seeing the use of ITC, ICT by um, extremist groups to erode trust and to create a destabilizing influence. We've seen this with, for example, in South Africa with digital vigilantism campaigns. We've seen it across Africa with disinformation campaigns, particularly in the lead up to elections. And that basically may be partly designed to provoke a response, to provoke a reaction from the state, whether it's a crackdown, uh, or it's to be able to, again, seize the narrative. So I think we are seeing uh, a very, very diverse way in which extremist groups are acquiring the use of emerging tech. States no longer have the monopoly on force or the monopoly on innovation. Remember, much of this emerging technology is being developed in the private sector, and therefore it's not within the domain of just the military. It is accessible by so many more of us. And with that comes a shift in power dynamics. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a snapshot of what we're seeing in this part of the world. Thank you very much, Karen, for that really, really comprehensive overview. I, I like the idea that the way I see it is that information technology is causing warfare to become more, more remote, which, as you say, expands the battle face space, right? And means we need to think about how a remote operations, remote killing becomes possible. You know, before the drone, there was the improvised explosive device, which has radically shifted the dynamic between insurgents and state actors all over the world. And I, I fear that the, the drone is potentially the kind of next iteration of that, depending on how non-state actors continue to deploy it. So thanks for highlighting that. Um, I'd like to, so, so I'd like to now go to kind of, I think, what's going to be the meat of today's discussion, which is really, really the state response, and particularly the role of the security sector as part of that response. So what are the ways in which you think African state and security sector actors are responding to this really wide sweeping, wide ranging threat that you've just laid out for us? And what role, you know, we've talked a lot about how, how uh, violent extremists are using emerging technology or information technology, how, how, how are states using information and communications technology as part of this broader response? Now, it's a good question. And I think this comes with a massive health warning because a lot of the information in this regard is in the purview of the intelligence services. It's not necessarily subject to oversight. So it's actually often very difficult to understand what's happening at the granular level and how uh, states are responding. But let's, let's try and give you a, a bit of a, a sense of how states are responding. Um, what we've seen is we've seen an effort to try and meet might with hardware. So let's use drones as the example. We've seen the increase in the use of UAS technologies in combat settings by African forces, the African Union forces uh, operating in the Horn of Africa. Um, we're seeing Portuguese military trainers are training Mozambican forces uh, in the northern area of Cabo Delgado uh, to be able to use um, drone capacity um, to be able to not only um, be able to use UAS technology to be able to um, also have greater surveillance and intelligence, but also the possibility of uh, mounting drone strikes uh, or, or other type attacks. I think it's worth pointing out that certainly we're seeing um, militaries across Africa using this emerging, this piece of emerging tech to try and um, regain dominance on the battlefield. But a lot of these technologies come with the forces that bring them in. What I mean by that is, you know, we have Africa that are coming in with the, the latest state of the art technology. Uh, we're seeing European forces, they're working in, in Mali, and also, as I say, I've just mentioned in Mozambique, uh, coming in with UAS technology. And one of the things that needs to come with that is the know-how and the, um, the support structures, if you like, so that African states acquire not only the piece of kit, but also the knowledge of how to deploy it 
but also when not to deploy it. And that opens up the whole argument in terms of, of some of the legal constraints. We're seeing tighter regulation uh, as a response uh, by, by a tighter regulation on kit. We've already seen many countries in Africa um, mandate the registration of SIM cards, knowing that mobile phones have played a significant role in attacks uh, by violent armed groups, whether it's to trigger IEDs, as you've mentioned, or to communicate or to coordinate or finance operations. It's interesting, we're seeing this um, idea of registration expanded. Ethiopia's Information Network Security Agency post on, post on Facebook um, on the 25th of last month that it's conducting what we can best describe as an audit to determine the current status of the information and communication devices that are available in country. Um, and basically what that means is it requires a wider range of technologies to be registered. So things like binoculars, compasses, GPS equipment, walkie-talkie, satellite phones, BGANs and drones. Uh, this technology will all have to be registered with the central authorities in Ethiopia. Where is there a problem with that? Well, a lot of this equipment gets used by reporters to communicate events from the battlefield. So one of the unintended consequences may be to shrink the ability for independent journalists or civil society actors to be able to bear witness to what's happening to, on, to ongoing conflict between say the TPLA and Ethiopian forces and to be able to hold those to account. We're seeing across Africa in response to the cyber threats that are posed both by uh, extremist groups, but also loan actors and criminal actors, a proliferation of legislation, lots of cyber crimes legislation and some limited cyber security legislation. As I talked to you today, South Africa's Cyber Crimes Act came onto the statute book yesterday, it was fully promulgated. Um, but like so many of these pieces of legislation, uh, implementation is a key challenge. The reason why states are bringing in legislation is that it provides for a really clear framework for things like mutual legal assistance uh, in the event of a major ICT attack, so that there's speedy international cooperation um, and so the perpetrators can be easily identified. What we're not seeing, and I know you haven't asked me yet what we're not seeing, that's later on possibly in the discussion, but just to make a reference is what we're not seeing is a proliferation of cybersecurity legislation. The reason why that's significant is, you know, in a setting like South Africa, there is great um, mistrust between um, the security providers and the intelligence services here. And I think that's replicated in many other parts of the continent. And so we've got legislation to try and deal with the crime once it's been perpetrated. There's less emphasis on the preventative strategies that need to be in place. Although we do have, of course, things like CSERTs, response protocols. I won't go into huge details, but individual response protocols at government, uh, public sector and private sector level, which are being rolled out across, across the continent. We're seeing more biometric technologies and surveillance-based uh, technologies being um, adapted and adopted by, uh, by, by states in response to security threats or perceived security threats. On the one hand, these biometric technologies uh, are incredibly important in being able to identify things like fraud and things like um, potential terrorist activity if there are specific individuals of, 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 of interest. But there are real concerns that this is shrinking the demographic space, either whether or not this gets into the hand of the wrong people or whether the wrong people into bad actors, whether there are breaches in privacy, uh, but also uh, whether these biometric technologies, which are initially you know, intended to give publics wider access to information, can those be weaponized? Um, we're seeing the securitization of emerging technology databases. So just to build on this point, let me give you Kenya as an example. In the move towards greater uh, biotechnology and, and the great um, and biometric databases, which largely are being rolled out as part of the sustainable development goals to give people access to identity and in doing so give them access to government services. In places like Kenya, these databases, which initially were the purview of the Home Affairs Department uh, of the Interior Ministry, 
are increasingly having a security component to it. What I mean by that is they, they provide a, a platform for access by the security services, and it raises all sorts of questions about encroachment into people's um, right, to, right to privacy. So it's a real balancing act that we're, we're seeing. We're seeing the shut, the, the, another tactic, we're seeing the shutting down of mainstream social media platforms. Um, and the promise to potentially create their own. Ethiopia is one of the countries that wants to do this. Uh, one of the reasons it says is to be able to control the um, dangerous narratives uh, that threaten the state. Uh, some critics say this is a means to be able to control dissent. And we've already seen uh, temporary shutdowns of social media platforms in countries such as Uganda, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Sudan. Quickly on the heels of that, some of those countries are considering social media legislation. Nigeria and Kenya are cases in point, which would require um, bloggers to be, to be vetted. Again, this is being done in the name of security and concerns that either um, battle plans are being put into the public domain, that battle tactics are being questioned by the wider public, a, a means of being able to control the space in the name of security. The reason why social media legislation is being proposed is again to try and ensure as a component on that, that those that are engaged in um, possibly tweeting or engaging in, in public discourse uh, about the course of, um, a, of national security or a national security threat uh, can be controlled to a point, but they also are putting pressure on social media providers, Twitter, Facebook and the like, to uh, open offices in their own countries. That uh, opens up the whole issue of uh, data sovereignty, and it would basically mean that those companies are subject to local laws. So again, I'll leave it at that, a fairly wide range, as far as we know in the public domain, of how these responses are being met. But I, I have, as I say, a massive health warning that goes with that, because in trying to talk to people before uh, this, this, um, this discussion today, it's extraordinary how deeply buried in the bowels of the intelligence services many of the answers to these questions are. And you know, what we're not seeing is a so much more human-centered approach uh, to, to ICT and potential national security threats. Thank you very much, Karen. So I'd actually particularly like to highlight both the first and the last thing that, that you said about how the model I think still is, is this idea that in order to, to meet technological advances by extremist organizations, the solution is always more and better technology rather than a more human-centric approach to kind of fighting warfare and insurgency. And I think if you look at how a lot of violent extremist conflicts have played out over the, the, the past 20 or 30 years, that assumption is probably wrong. I mean, states are, are in virtually every case, more sophisticated users of information technology than extremist groups are, yet they still manage to be very, very challenged in, in confronting them. So I think that's a really, really excellent point. All right, so so now I'd like to bring in uh, my colleague, uh, Murtala. So uh, Karen has given us a really comprehensive overview of how uh, states are responding to extremist groups using of ICT across Africa. I'd like to now talk specifically about how some of the dynamics Karen just mentioned are playing out in Northeastern Nigeria uh, in efforts to confront ISWAP in the in the Boko Haram in, in the Lake Chad Basin. So, so my question to you, uh, Murtala, is how has information technology been employed by both security sector and violent extremist groups in Nigeria? And in your view, kind of to, to build on Karen's last point, which actor has, has employed information technology more effectively? Uh, thank you very much, Nick, and uh, for this platform. Uh, Karen made a lot of uh, important uh, points that uh, I will also roll over or try to explain as it relates to Nigeria and the Chad Basin. Uh, your, your question is quite an interesting one, really, and uh, there's not been a lot of conversation, especially on the use of information technology and the activities of violent extremist organization uh, in the Chad Basin. And so for me, this is quite very uh, it's very important. Uh, so one thing that we have really noticed over the years is that uh, uh, violent extremist organizations, whether it's the Boko Haram or the Islamic State West African province, uh, uh, their use of information technologies has evolved over the past 12 years. Uh, we have seen better in terms of better imagery 
And this is quite uh, uh, because in Nigeria and in the region in fact, there's been improvement in terms of access and modernization of uh, information and technology tools and also the availability of more internet service. So what happens here is that as the broader public uh, makes use of these devices uh, for general activities, uh, violent extreme organizations have all gotten access to these uh, tools and are now using it uh, to further in furtherance of their uh, violent campaign against the government in the region and also civilians. Uh, we have seen media gadgets become one of the like uh, important aspects of their campaign for disseminating uh, propaganda materials, uh, uh, winning hearts and minds in terms of the population centric approach, especially for high swap. Uh, we have also seen the use of drones. Uh, but not in the scale, as uh, Karen has mentioned, but not in the scale of what we have seen in the Middle East. Uh, mostly these drones, off, off the shelf drones, are usually uh, captured from security forces, have been used either in support of propaganda or in support of battlefield uh, uh, attack. So, for example, in improving the accuracy of, uh, of, of the artillery weapons, some of which, a lot of which have uh, way they are stolen from. Uh, uh, government forces in the region or to for surveillance of uh, government bases uh, so that they, are, they could better. Uh, right, so also in terms of the use of drones uh, for surveillance of government bases. So it's not been as sophisticated as those in the Middle East where sometimes it get big uh, with uh, explosive uh, target uh, uh, troops. Well, this is a weak. Uh, it doesn't mean that because it's not happening now, it wouldn't happen in the future. Uh, information technology has also allowed people to have access to knowledge from other regions, so which means that these huge weeks of them but improving what they already have by learning from others. So uh, the global right. So basically, I was talking about the use of media gadgets in support of the uh, campaigns by both uh, Boko Haram and ISWAP. And we have also seen the fact that ISWAP have had better uh, access to this media gadget and it reflects in the quality of uh, propaganda that it keeps it from aging. Uh, it's propaganda in two forms. Uh, one, either to demoralize troops, uh, the count troops countering the activity, or two, to support their campaign of winning hearts and minds. So it's quite interesting how they've been able to adapt in terms of, of their gadgets and the improvement of these gadgets. Uh, I was also talking about the access to off-the-shelf drones. Uh, these are usually captured from security forces in the region after raids and ambushes. Uh, we have not seen the same sophistication in terms of how they are uh, re-engineered, uh, like what we see in the Middle East, where sometimes they get rid of explosives. But here, what it, what it is used for, it's for surveillance and also the support of its propaganda activity. Uh, there are a lot of potentials in terms of uh, drones and other information technology of how these groups use them. Uh, so it's a waste for government in the region to really catch up. Uh, then also we have seen the groups also understand the weeks that some of these uh, tools provide. And so either because uh, information technology tools allow them to communicate between themselves, with their families, it also increases weeks of them uh, becoming uh, of targets for security forces. And so uh, we have seen attempts to restrict uh, in terms of the movement of uh, mobile devices. Uh, also, we have seen them targeting uh, telecommunication facilities. Uh, although they also make use of telecom uh, for, uh, facilities to propagate their activity, but they also target these. And so more recently, we've seen a spike in targeting of these uh, telecom uh, facilities. So it's quite ironic. Uh, I think the, so the idea here is to restrict how others make use of uh, either communication or internet services, why also they find a way to make use of that. Uh, in terms of the government, so the Nigerian government, uh, I'll be speaking on what I know in terms of the Nigerian government, originally by the late Chad Presidency, because we know the problem uh, uh, in terms of activity of ISWAP, Boko Haram extends to Chad, Niger, Cameroon, and Nigeria. On the perspective of the Nigerian government, uh, not much is known uh, in terms of the extent 
of these capabilities in terms of information technology and how it's used. And this is largely because of the secrecy, the security sector, and also low transparency. Uh, however, projects from the state, uh, sometimes you have security equipment, a single line phase, security equipment, or you have a line phase OSIP, open source intelligence tool. That gives you a little glimpse of what sort of capability is going to be so. So we know that the Nigerian state has rested uh, in supporting security forces uh, to have information technology uh, tools that allows them to conduct better intelligence gathering, monitoring, and also forensics. Uh, this has uh, helped uh, to a certain extent the conduct of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations uh, in the region. Uh, we have also seen a rapid build up in terms of use of unmanned aerial vehicles, drones. Uh, Nigeria is one of the prominent states in Africa that has, has a fleet of unmanned aerial vehicles, as they think back to. 2016, when uh, the first batch of the Chinese CH3 drones were used, uh, the armed drones, that uh, it was during a spike when, when, when the government was responding to a spike. And so there was a lot of attempts to retrieve the armed forces. And part of the retrieving was both in terms of ground capabilities, ranging from farm uh, to better rifles with schools and other things, and then also the use of uh, helicopter gunships and then. The, um, uh, the armed variant of the, of the Chinese drone uh, was inducted and it was being used, but they had uh, technical issues and uh, not all of them were fully operational. Uh, then the government also decided to acquire more. And so uh, they've been linked with the Nigerian government with the airborne flash. Uh, at least one was seen accidentally in the image that was shared uh, during a visit of the Chief of Estaf to the northeast. Uh, but what we know is that the Nigerian government has acquired uh, additional drones uh, in terms of the, uh, is acquiring more in terms of the CH3, the CH4, and then the week long uh, drones. So this rapidly expands the ability to conduct ISR missions and to also target. So what the government is trying to do is to close the gap between. Uh, monitoring of the surgeon activity and its ability to target this group quickly or in the, uh, quickly to degrade that capability. Uh, but again, uh, there are a lot of issues around this also, uh, as we have seen not just in Nigeria. Also, we have seen uh, investment in uh, providing sensors for uh, manned air, air, man aircraft, uh, like the beach craft and the ATL-42. Uh, these have also been really very important. Uh, recently, the budget included two beach craft that will be acquisition replacement for the two other beach craft that were lost. Uh, one, uh, in, uh, one, the former chief of army staff uh, died in a, a crash uh, with him, Katuna, in northwestern Nigeria. And then there was also another crash in Abuja, uh, and Nigeria's capital. So there will be acquisition replacement for these aircraft. Although in the budget, this beach craft. Uh, uh, we, we know that what will happen is that uh, sensors will be embedded to support the military campaign. So, generally, investment in technology products for intelligence monitoring, collection, processing has been one of the provided tools for counterterrorism assessment operations in Nigeria, uh, alongside the traditional human intelligence activities that uh, security forces engage in. However, there has been observable gap in the in terms of the ground and airborne capabilities, uh, for example, signal intelligence, your special intelligence, uh, which are like very crucial to gain both tactical and strategic advantage over the project group. Uh, we have also seen, not we have not seen also the maximization of these uh, of these tools, including the country's uh, satellite uh, uh, satellite capabilities uh, uh, in terms of furtherance of the of the uh, counterterrorism operation. So there, is, uh, there has to be a nexus between the human capacity on ground and then the technology. So no matter how much investment you do in technology, if the required human capacity is not there, it's going to be a problem. And so even when you have the required human capacity and the required investment in technology, or the product strategy is not effective, then it becomes a problem. So it's it has to be closely knitted in terms of the investment information technology tools, the human capacity, and the broader counter counterinsurgency strategy for you to make any uh, headway. So, 
So we have seen the government really make uh, progress in terms of using of these tools, but uh, like I said, they, there's a room for a lot of improvement and lots of understanding of them. Uh, sometimes ironic that we have seen improvement in certain areas, especially in the use of information technology, uh, but we have also seen huge deficit, for example, in terms of building proper bases, providing tools to the required needs and support that they need. And so, uh, no matter, for example, if you have drones flying over switches that don't have effective morale, that don't have effective tactics, uh, it doesn't make huge, it doesn't make any specific uh, difference. So you need to also solve some of the fundamental issues on ground, ensure that you have a professional fighting force that is highly, that has good morale. So this is when the uh, technological tools become really useful for you. Uh, one area really where we have seen certain tools uh, of play uh, case is in the area of propaganda and support of campaign. And so uh, a lot of times we have uh, groups like ISWA, uh, BH providing better information sometimes. Hey, can I can I come in and interrupt you real, real quick? Sorry again. I, I want to have I want to do one 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 round of one last round of questions. But I think you you actually made a really really good point about how um, you can have all the technology in the world, but if you don't have the human resources to act on it, it's not gonna it's not gonna be worth the intelligence that you gather or or collect. I think that's a really 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 crucial point. Something that added on what what Karen was saying. It doesn't matter how much. Uh, you know, surveillance you collect, if you don't have somebody to actually act on that intelligence, if you don't use the information that you have about, say, how your troops are being supplied to actually, you know, supply them, then you're not going to be making much of a difference in the battlefield. I want to ask you and Karen, I think you have laid out some, uh, given a really comprehensive job of all the ways in which states are attempting to respond to the, the, the threat from extremist groups and how they use ICT, um, but also a lot of the, the challenges, right, about, you know, having um, investments in technology not necessarily aligning with resources, about there being potentially second and third order uh, consequences, about actually dealing with very, very innovative ways in which violent extremists are using technology, everything from remote warfare to kind of propaganda operations. So a few minutes for each of you, how do you think states can better respond? What would you, if you had two or three you know, pieces of, of, of insight that you, you think that you would like to share with, with our colleagues here today, what would they be? So we'll start with you, uh, Murtala, we'll, we'll end with you, Karen. Uh, all right, thank you very much, uh, Nate. So in, this is really very important, really. It can and should do better, really. And as Ilya mentioned that uh, them doing better has to be part uh, information technology or technological tools. It's not a switch button. Uh, it can only be effective when it's part of a broader strategy in terms of counterterrorism, counterinsurgency. And so we have also seen attempts in terms of biometric data to ensure that people who own SIM cards uh, have their biometric data captured and integration of that. It's not been very effective. We have had this cyber act, cyber crime act that has been passed by the Nigerian government. We've not seen that making a uh, lot of difference. We have had attempts to shut down uh, telecommunication services or we restrict social media services. This has not been effective because the the foundation and the and the strategy or behind it has really been deficient. So there needs to be a change. So if and this this will take me to the next point and where we're talking about telecommunication, social media restriction. Uh, for me, it would be much more better and much more productive to engage social media companies or technology companies to see areas where you can build partnership. Uh, how do you cope or make it harder for violent organizations to gain access uh, to use your, your to use this platform? It's better than shutting them down. Because for example, in Nigeria, where you have Twitter ban, it has really bring out public resentment against the government. Uh, so the, when the government next time tells people that there are weeks associated with technology, people will say, you're trying to calm down public spaces, civic spaces, because you know the people use them. So you need to be very careful on how you, on government need to better engage with the private sector, both at domestic and international level. Uh, you can see a lot of the short times that happen did not achieve much in terms of telecom also. Uh, you had more hardship for rural communities. When, you, when you're supposed to in fact, make your counterinsurgency policy more 
friendly to the people so that you can win hearts and minds in terms of population centric approach. So it has to involve better engagement with domestic and international partners in the private sector. So also in terms of public sector, like uh, better engagement with governments that have used some of these ICT tools in furtherance of counterterrorism, counterinsurgency operation, whether it's in Mali or whether it's in the Middle East. And so some of these countries like Britain are partners of Nigeria, so also in terms of the United States. But there's also another side of it. There has to be transparency, accountability to prevent the use of these uh, tools and skills uh, in abuse of human rights or violation of a right of the people. Uh, so this is really, for me, this is at the, this is the meat of the issue. I think you've made a strong case for states needing to adopt a more uh, technology, uh, uh, population centric approach with how they use technology and one that is more collaborative with other actors, such as the, the private sector. Um, Karen, would you agree with that basic argument? You have anything else to kind of add to how to, to Mortala's insights in terms of how states can do better? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree with the points that Mortala made. And, and, you know, there is examples of where you can engage the private sector, not just in capacity building, but also in knowledge transfer. You know, it's a reasonable question to say, could you trust a private company to be involved, for example, in some issues of national security? Well, it's happening already. It's happening in other countries like the UK, where they actually have a placement system with a private sector industry coming to work uh, at some of the key sort of cyber um, uh, centers, cyber hubs. Uh, so there is uh, examples of how it's possible to be to, to work together to be able to ring fence that engagement. I agree totally with Matala's point about needing to engage um, some of the social media companies uh, to effectively see where, and this is already happening to, to, a, to a large degree, but I think it needs to be more proactive rather than reactive. We're seeing very reactive strategies to social media uh, perceived threats, uh, and I think a much more uh, proactive approach would certainly go in, 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 in African states' favour. I think one thing just to note um, is that when we talk about sort of what the state, what states should be doing uh, to more effectively and more strategically um, target the threat, I think even talking about the fact that there is a threat is, is, is an important part of that narrative. Uh, we have, you know, the African Union has got a digital transformation strategy, which is very important because the digital, um, the new digital revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, is seen very much through a narrative of development, which is absolutely right. But without being able to have a conversation about the potential threats, it makes it a very, very skewed conversation. So I would almost go back to basics and say, as part of uh, government's attempts to um, to grapple with this potential threat, acknowledge that there is a threat, but acknowledge the threat and engage uh, civil society, engage the private sector, uh, and realize that if you deploy technology in a unstrategic way, in a random way, you do risk, for example, um, undermining access to, for example, human intelligence. So we talk about drone technology being uh, incredibly important and powerful, which it is, from an intelligence gathering point of view. However, if you're deploying it in a way that is going to undermine the possibility of ex accessing human intelligence, and that is still required on the ground, then you know, we need a much, much more clear, um, a clear, clear approach. The other thing I would just add is I think there needs to be, I think states need to be much more questioning and much more cautious about the motives of some of their tech suppliers. So we've talked about the use of biometric technologies and the dash to use biometric technologies to be able to um, identify potential threat actors. That's right, maybe with this very, very rapid rollout of these technologies, one has to ask who is benefiting from that rapid rollout of technologies? Are there other actors that are benefiting from some of the surveillance norms that come with that? And, you know, that may not be a problem, but governments need to be aware that, you know, they, what is happening to the data that's being acquired, and also um, what, what, what are the drivers for adopting many of these technologies to try and meet uh, these extremist groups head on. Because they will always be judged much, much more harshly than the extremist group by the wider public. public. I mean, that, that is the bottom line. Thanks. Yeah. So I like I add into that. I think I think you know um, I think it's really important to think through some of the second and third order consequences of what states are doing, and particularly when it comes to kind of restricting the fleet flow of information 
you know, we, we talk about here a lot at the Africa Center that there are actually trade-offs of sort of an overly intelligence gathering focused approach to engaging with the local population. And I think certainly you have to wrap uh, um, uh, techno technological ways to gather intelligence in with, with that broader conversation. So um, excellent point. So now we're gonna, we're gonna turn to uh, Q and A. Um, we already have a lot of really, really great questions, but in case you uh, are, are begging to ask a question, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to submit your written questions for panelists. Um, you may submit your question in any language that you like, and I will convey as many questions as our time will allow. We have about uh, 20 minutes. So uh, as promised, um, first question um, from our colleague in Niger, uh, and the question is, um, uh, is basically it's about regulation. Is it not important to regulate the use of emerging technology, or shall we say information technology, um, because of all of its uh, disruptive potential on the economy, society, other other sectors? I mean, I think this is a, this is a question that the last point you raised about how do we, how, are, are regulations necessary to confront the downsides of the digital revolution, especially as they pertain to enabling violent extremist activity? And, and if so, what's what's the answer? What are some preliminary answers here? Um, uh, why don't we go, uh, Mortala? Then, or uh, either either of you are welcome to comment. But um, why don't we start with Mortala? If you have any any thoughts there, and then we'll go to Karen. Uh, this is quite. Uh, it's quite an important question in terms of regulations, and we have seen governments try. That. So, for example, uh, access to drones in Nigeria is heavily regulated. In paper, technically, you need to even get clearance from the Office of the National Security Advisor uh, before. Or you can fly drones uh, in the country. So there's been a lot, but still, uh, non state actors find a way to get access to these off the shelf materials, whether by capturing them from security forces or from buying them in the black market. The so it's one thing to have regulations, really, but it's the ability to exploit. So, for example, if you have non state actors who have access to the uh, drones, how do you really counter that threat or how do you use that threat for your own benefit? Because these tools. They also create vulnerabilities for this group. And the vulnerabilities that a lot of governments sometimes provide them with the rare edge that makes huge difference, both tactically and strategically. Thanks, uh, Karen. Yeah. Um, I, I feel quite strongly. Um, yes, there needs to be regulation, but it needs to be smart regulation. Um, and the use of carrot and stick. So, you know, with, with drone technology, um, you know, I have this debate with colleagues often. They say, well, you know, are extremists really going to um, respond to uh, regulations that say they can't use drones? Well, there are things that can be done, for example, um, kite marking and being able to identify large consignments of drones for example, when they come in across a border to a specific territory, a means of being able to flag up. We've talked about the possibility of some hobbyist drones being um, uh, serial numbers being recorded, a sort of similar registration database to the same way that mobile phones uh, are, are, are registered. So there are ways of doing this. Um, a lot of the agreements, things like the Vassanar Agreement on sort of exports of, of um, uh, listing equipment, could we possibly consider something similar like that to drones? I think it's worthy of, of exploration. But I think that also needs to be a way of being able to incentivize the private sector to help get on board with this, whether that's in terms of providing carrots and sticks or kite marking, so that they have the means to be able to engage in this and be able to actually find ways of being able to track whether you know, these dual use technologies, and I think we do have to emphasize, they are dual use technologies and they have extraordinary benefits from a humanitarian perspective, also from a business perspective across the board, but the business have got an incentive to sell these things. So I think there is an argument to uh, engage the private sector that are producing these technologies to find ways of being able to regulate them. Thank you very, very much. So we actually have a bunch of questions coming in. So I'm gonna ask maybe three questions and Let's kick it over to you, then maybe do one final round of questions. I imagine that's probably all we're going to have time for. So we have kind of one question on engaging tele telecom companies. The, the, the questioner agrees that engaging them is ideal, but, you know, is concerned about, you know, that, that potentially that the profit motive or other things, you know, undermines their ability to potentially cooperate effectively uh, with the government. Um, so I, I think the question is, I, I, one question is, how do you, how do you um, effectively engage 
telecommunications companies and reconcile the government's interests have in dealing with violent extremist threats, the telecom's interest that has uh, the telecom's interest in in um, making a profit, but also I would say the people's interest in not being and having and, and maintaining their rights. How do you balance those three? I think imperatives. Um, I would would be the question I would post all three of their are all, all both of our panels building on that on that question. And then another another question we have is what about kind of the unintended or counterproductive uh, consequences of the use of information technology uh, by streets or, or or violent extremist groups, right? And I, I think that's actually also a really interesting and important question. So, so um, you know, uh, what the example the, the 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 speaker uses, like so, for example, closing the internet off, right? Does that have counterproductive, independent consequences? Do sometimes uh, violent extremist groups overreach in their propaganda operations or their use of social media? Um, or, or, you know, or how they're using information technology. And I think to Mertala's points and how could, how could states potentially capitalize on those strategic mistakes? Um, and then sort of another question on, um, in French, do, do beyond the will to fight? So the question is, do states really have the technical and financial means to, to, to face this, this threat um, under, under head of that? Can they effectively uh, uh, protect personal data? You know, we know that, that, uh, African states are are uh, still many of them developing. They don't have certainly sophisticated technological capabilities compared to more industrialized countries for the most part. So I think the question is, do they really have the capabilities to effectively manage the the scope and scale of the threat at this time? Um, so let's go in reverse, Karen. Why don't we go to you? Answer any of those three questions you'd like, and then we'll go to um, Rital. And hopefully, we have time for one more round of questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to answer them fairly quickly. In terms of engaging with the, the telephone companies, um, I think you're right. I think the profit motive is what drives them, uh, but also um, the threat of reputational damage, I think, is also very real. Uh, and therefore, if telephone companies are seen as their platforms are being used, their mobile phone platforms are being used for um, uh, by, by, by threat actors, by extremist groups, I think there is an entry point for engagement on that to, 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 to try and at least have them um, in, involved in practical measures that could at least uh, track or, or, or restrict how, uh, how their, te their technologies are being used. So I think reputational damage is, is something that is a stick that could be used against um, uh, telephone companies, uh, not normally ones who encourage sticks, but I think in this context, um, it's worthy, it's certainly worthy of debate. Um, you know, ultimately who controls the spectrum? Well, it is governments and um, ultimately they can turn it off. I'm not suggesting that they do that as a tactic, but again, they are not without the, the, the although the balance of power between uh, telecoms providers and states are, uh, is, is, is slightly skewed and there are a limited number of players in the market, there are uh, carrots and sticks, incentives and disincentives that can be used to try and, and bring, them, bring them on side. Um, and, and that also includes, by the way, um, some of the social media companies um, in, be in being able to uh, does Facebook want to be associated with acts of terror? Does uh, Twitter want to be associated with violent extremist group? There is work already being done. I think there's more work that can be done to try and incentivize companies to, uh, to engage on that. Um, can I just pick up on the question about the mistakes that might be made by um, how to capitalize and exploit, exploit uh, mistakes that might be made by extremist groups online? Um, I'm going to give a parallel because I can't give you an example specifically with an extremist group that, but that exhi exhibiting propaganda. But given the, the use of open source tools, it's very easy to often pick up very important intelligence clues uh, that are hidden and buried uh, when organizations or people seek to exhibit things that they've done. The comparison within the world of corruption is how many times have um, uh, elite actors been identified as being corrupt individuals because they happen to exhibit on Facebook or other social media platforms the latest car they've purchased. And with that, we see the number plate and using open source tools, it's very, very, very easy to be able to identify who they are and where they are. So uh, I think there is a really, really strong case for arming um, our security services, but also our police 
uh, and also the military in some of these open source data tools that get used by journalists and get used by civil society actors as well to be able to pick out some of the clues uh, that are exhibited online by uh, the very actors that use those ICT technologies to exhibit and to um, radicalize and to, and, to seek, and to gain propaganda from their, from their acts. Martala, I, hopefully, I, I wanna get in hopefully one, the last round of questions too, so we can give you very, very quick takeaway. So Martala, go ahead, do you have any, any responses right. or things to add? Yeah, just to add up to what Karina said really. And so uh, we have seen regulations and, and also partnership within uh, telecom communication services and also uh, government. Uh, and then a lot of times the national security uh, Button is pulled to get retrieve some uh, data from telecom to come in or to cause them to take certain action. But there's also been a lot of concern about the abuse of these uh, these powers uh, to target civilians. And why there was uh, there was a push to uh, pass in Nigeria the Digital Freedom Act. So these kind of regulations will require, for example, if you need the telecom to uh, come in to do something, then a judge needs to give an approval that say this action is required based on national security concern, but not the government defining what national security is, because yes, it could actually be a terror threat, but sometimes what is considered as national security could actually just be regime security. And so there, so putting the leap and showing that the, there's some kind of uh, institutional protection to ensure that this uh, partnership is not abused, and that uh, it's very important. Uh, as also really we have seen in terms of, uh, uh, information technology tools, yeah, governments in the region may not necessarily have the kind of capabilities and resources like others do, like the Western partners, but they also tend, we have seen them use these resources for their own good in terms of uh, protecting political interests of interest of the political class. And so these tools are, are very important uh, for really, in fact, understanding how groups operate. And I, I love the fact that Karen mentioned in terms of the open source intelligence, there's lots of gold mines of information. It provides uh, the use of these uh, information technology tools by violent extremist organizations, provide a lot of uh, access to information for intelligence analysts and, and, all, and all other people, uh, security forces. But it, how much you make use of it depend on your own capacity. And so you need to build your own capacity, uh, your own either in terms of human skill or the equipment and so for either electronic intelligence, communication intelligence, et cetera. So it depends on really your own capacity. And so we've seen that really. And uh, it's an important force multiplier, especially in asymmetrical warfare, where you have a very fluid and flexible and mobile uh, adversary. And so really information technology is part of the tools that you can use to anticipate, to track, to monitor, and to really better your your counterterrorism approach. I think that's a really excellent point on the last question about, about costs and capabilities. Look, states have been fighting insurgencies for hundreds and hundreds of years without sophisticated technology. I think, if anything, the balance of, of, of technological sophistication, even in, in less developed countries, uh, is greater on the state side than on the violent extremist side. So really, as you point out, it's a question of how do you use information technology resources in a way that, that as part of a broader uh, counter in for counterterrorism strategy, right? And that, I think that's where the, the, the key challenges are. Um, okay, so um, a large uh, last series of questions, I'm gonna just do a, a, all of them. And, and if just if you each of you have just a few concluding thoughts, that would be great. So one, I think this is gonna be more towards you, Martala, about including the bandits and other organized groups who are becoming more sophisticated in their use of, of technology. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of coverage, I think, about the rise of banditry in northeastern Nigeria. And so maybe when we think about violent extremist groups, we should think we should think about a lot of other kind of violent non-state actors that we're increasingly seeing in various parts of Africa. Um, I'd be curious your take on that. Um, another one, maybe this is slightly more suited for, for Karen, although um, Martal, if you have a uh, uh, commentary, feel free. It's what are the different types of drones and, and how how ought they ought they be deployed to respond to the, the threat? That's actually a good question because there are very different drones with very different types of capabilities. Um, and then um, let's see, um, I, th there was another question in the chat, the point that was in, in the chat that I thought was really, really good, which is that, um, you know, it's concern that when you're in, in the process of getting training, the concern that knowledge of state security agencies in charge of CV is limited and that, that when they're getting training, you might actually um, incidentally be training 
uh, corrupt officials or people with links to insurgents in the use of, of information technology. So especially in a lot of conflicts in Africa where the, the, the dividing lines between who's an enemy and who's not, you know, there, there are linkages between the states and violent criminal organizations and networks. I think a question is when you are actually adopting technology, um, who in that kind of situation is it benefiting and how do you, how do you have policies in place to maybe prevent uh, technology transfer in that way to kind of a violent extremist groups. Um, so, uh, Murtala, if you have any of those you'd like to answer, then we'll go to Karen for a few quick words. About two minutes each would be great if you could, you could both be brief. All right, thank you, Nate. And well, it's quite an interesting question when you talk about bandits so in the Northwest. Uh, so, what we see in terms of groups in the Northwest, uh, they kind of have also mobile devices and use all those things, uh, especially because it, it do a lot of ransom negotiation. Uh, this is something that some, a lot of people have wondered why security forces have not used this uh, uh, exposure to track these groups and all that. And it goes back to what I said earlier, is that even when you can track, uh, for example, mobile devices, it's also another thing to be able to conduct uh, operation, an effective operation, uh, like what we saw in terms of the US operations, uh, uh, I think in 20, December 2020, where they rescued an American citizen that was kidnapped in Nigeria and brought over into Nigeria, where uh, Navy SEALs were dispatched to conduct that kind of. So it's one thing to be able to know, okay, uh, based on tracking, we have found this group to be here and there, and then it's one thing to be able to really go there and conduct uh, kind of surgical operations that it should. Uh, so uh, in terms of also vulnerability of these uh, skills falling into the hands of uh, non-state actors, it's also that we see, for example, a lot of times uh, violent extremist organizations in Northeast tend to benefit a lot by, by tuition campaign against state forces, uh, where, they, where, they, where they steal uh, some of the equipment from state uh, forces, including uh, on, on man area vehicle, up the shelves, small of man area vehicle, and all these things are used against the state. So, uh, capacity in terms of the intelligence services, uh, we know that this is strict uh, in terms of equipment process, also, which makes it a bit difficult for such an infiltration to happen. Uh, but yet, it's a concern that I hope authorities are taking into consideration. On drones, yeah, we have most, uh, probably just uh, the fact that drones are used in terms of ISL and also airstrike. Uh, so, but in terms of uh, having platforms that can conduct the two, this has been uh, a kind of edge factor for, for for the Nigerian security forces, being able to, to at the same time conduct ISI mission and also take out targets, especially high value targets. Uh, so these are things that we've seen. We've also seen attempts to build domestic drones, uh, apart from just buying from other countries. So drones appear to be the, the emerging or like the next thing in terms of uh, asymmetric warfare. We've also seen like interest in unmanned ground vehicles, uh, but that's still uh, in the basics level, or we've not seen more investment in that. Thank you very, very much, Karen. Final uh, final thoughts to you. Um, I'm going to be very, very um, cautious and sidestep slightly the issue about the drones, but I want to just share some information because we're looking at the impact of the drones rather than the technical specifications. But in really very, very simple terms, we're looking at land-based drones, uh, maritime drones, potential drone swarms, which are military-grade drones, uh, UAS, um, uh, and we are also looking at the hobbyist type systems, UAS drones, which are also can include the small quadcopters in this part of the world. Uh, there are lots of Chinese providers that are uh, saturating the market. Um, if someone wants to uh, learn a lot more about drones and the different varieties that are available, they could look at something very useful website, which I'll happily share, which is called Drone Industry Insights, which basically scopes the use of UAS across not only the military sphere, but also the commercial and humanitarian sphere in this part of the world. Uh, another quick point on the drones is, is it's interesting because although it's useful to know the types of UAS uh, that we're looking at, uh, bear in mind what we're seeing in other parts of the world, particularly in the, in the Middle East, is either technology transfer, so um, different groups are effectively sharing uh, their knowledge about how to adapt and to tweak um, these aerial systems for their own advantage, but we're also seeing evidence of um, indigenous innovation. So what that means simply is that just because we are seeing 
uh, US system is being used in a particular way in the Middle East, in Iraq and Syria, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that we're going to see them applied in the same in the same way here, and we'll see innovation happening locally as opposed to know-how being imported from the Middle East. In terms of my general thoughts, just in terms of wrapping up, I, I would encourage African states to be much more strategic um, in terms of how they deploy technology to meet might with might. Uh, be aware that the speed of adaptation among non-state actors is always going to be faster in many ways uh, than, than states, just because of the very hierarchical nature of states, whereas a lot of the extremist groups that we're seeing are networked. I would also say pick your battles, and no pun intended. A huge amount of um, effort put into um, information operations uh, social media, how social media is being utilized by um, extremist groups in terms of being able to use some of the open source data tools that we talked about or being able to counter the narratives would go a long way to try to mitigate some of the threats, particularly in Africa where the biggest threat is cyber crime. And we've talked about the nexus between cyber crime and uh, cyber terrorism and extremist groups using um, uh, cyber enabled fraud. Um, use of internet platforms to be able to trade uh, sort of a, a, an e-marketplace, to be able to trade rubies, to be able to trade wildlife products, ivory, uh, narcotics, for the purposes of financing the acts of, of terrorism, extremism. Again, much more of a focus on, on that, I think, could go a long way to actually trying to help uh, mitigate the threat. Um, so with that, it's time to conclude the webinar. Allow me on behalf of the Africa Center on Alumni to thank both of our panelists for their really excellent and insightful contributions today. It's always evidence you have an engaged audience when you have an engaged chat. And I can say, I think the same thing, chat has been about it, as engaged I've seen it in a webinar. Um, just one kind of major takeaway for me today before we finally, finally conclude. I think for me, um, one thing that became really, really clear in, in today's conversation is that the digital dimensions of the threat posed by violent extremist groups is different from traditional security threats. Um, states across Africa are very used to thinking of security as a domain exclusively for the security sector and often insist on the need for secrecy and complete security sector control over strategies, operations, and tactics to counter the threats from violent non-state actors. Um, first of all, I'd argue this is only questionably true uh, when it comes to traditional security threats, but as I think we've heard today, this kind of thinking, this need for secrecy and lack of transparency is actually counterproductive when it comes to countering threats from uh, violent extremist groups that are digital in nature. And that's because, first of all, uh, digital technology is shifting the balance of power between public and private sector actors. Even if the states wanted to, they don't have uh, the, the kind of same kind of control over ICT infrastructure or social media platforms. They might over physical weapons platforms, for example. Um, second of all, an overly secretive and securitized approach to information technology policy uh, risks undermining the exact kind of trust, transparency, and local support needed to win in the fight against insurgent groups, extremist groups, as Mortal has point out, pointed out. Um, Extremist groups like ISWAP have grown in part because how savvy they are in using information technology to win local support, um, be it through IEDs, be it through tailored operation campaigns, um, or, or, or be it through, through a lot of the strategic and, and tactical advances with respect to drones and other remote warfare that we've talked about. Um, it's therefore not enough for governments to assume, as, as I think they often do, is this very reflexive assumption that uh, just more technology, more sophisticated surveillance systems, biometric identification systems, more autonomous aircraft are going to give them the capabilities they need to have a decisive strategic advantage over violent extremist groups. Um, uh, as Audrey Kurth Cronin has said, who was a panelist at our, at our last webinar on this topic, wrote in her book, there is no direct line between technological innovation and successful strategy. And violent extremism has spread across Africa in part because violent extremists have become adept at using information technology to support population-centric strategies and tactics. And to be blunt, states have not. So I, I think it's up for African governments, uh, the international community, and African uh, to, to put citizens at the center of how they use ICT to counter the violent extremist threat. 
and I don't really claim to have all the answers here. I think hopefully this is the start of a conversation. Um, I, I do think part of the, the, the solution involves is I think both of our panelists have highlighted in a less securitized kind of more multi-stakeholder whole of society approach to how states are addressing the digital dimensions of the violent extremist threat. So thank you all for your participation. Um, and I wish you all a wonderful evening uh, in Africa. And I look forward hopefully to continuing this conversation in the future. Good night.